Good morning, Hall Boulevard. How are you? <laughs> we got the sun. The sun decided to come out on this Sunday, fitting its name. It's awesome. All right. Well, let's um, let us stand, if you would, and we'll sing our God and get this morning started. day to fill us up and to remind us of your glory as we go throughout the week, as we face this week's battles and this this week's peaks, God. Thank you so much, and may we give you praise in all of it. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Justin and family are on vacation. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. Be, be, you can be loud. You've got to fill the place with song and laugh. There you go. I like that. Yeah. Okay. Listen, you know, you, you got to do that to keep, you know, keep my blood flowing a little bit this morning. It was a long night. Uh, we made the announcement in Sunday school. Gracie, uh, was it two or three trips she made up to the hospital last night? She, two trips, they give her a shot, sent her home. And at 1 o'clock, I'm talking to Tanya while she's you know, driving home, and she was none too happy that they'd sent her daughter home for a second time, but they got her back in this morning, and she's in the delivery room, and uh, it looks like, uh, okay, it looks like little Danny will be arriving on the scene sometime today, not without a couple of hiccups. I mean, why not? 
Uh, they belong to me. A hiccup here and a hiccup there is what you expect. But be praying for Gracie and Diego, if you would. I'd really appreciate it. Uh, Tanya said Diego is hanging in there tough. He's probably only said five words since they got in. But, you know, he's uh, lost a little color in his face. He's a little nervous. And, uh, of course, Gracie's in uh, uh, somewhat a bit of discomfort herself. So uh, the only people in the room are... Uh, Diego and Tanya and, of course, Gracie and little Danny on the way, of course, with doctors and everybody else. Uh, but uh, be praying. We'll get everybody. We'll put it out as soon as we know. We'll make that announcement. But uh, it's good to have you here today. And I pray that God has been able to bless you through this week and that uh, you'll find a blessing just for you today as we come together. And for those of you that are watching and you're out there, you're part of our family, I pray that same blessing upon you, that today God will able to bless you richly with a blessing just for you that God has planned for you today. I'd like to take a minute, and uh, of course, uh, uh, Big Brother is up here this morning, and pray for him. He has an audition for a Shakespeare play that's coming uh, up this fall, so uh, uh, be in prayer for him. He has that this afternoon. So, Father, we just want to thank you. I, I thank you for the worship that we can attend today, and I just echo an amen to all that Paul has prayed. But right now, Lord, my, my, my prayer is lifted up for Gracie, for Diego, for Danny that, Lord, you will surround them with the love and protection that they need. And may your spirit be abundantly felt in that delivery room. And, Lord, the, the complications are there. Let's take them out of the way and let them not be complications at all. But, Father, do what is necessary to guard and protect this family. And Lord, uh, I, I thank you for the love that, that uh, they hold for you and, and the commitment to raise Danny up. Lord, to know the faithfulness of our God. So, Father, I just pray with all of my heart that uh, knowing you're in that room with them, that, Lord, you're just superintendent over my little family. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Let's worship together. All right. Open the eyes of my heart. Feel free to stand or stay seated however you wish to worship this morning. Shining in the light of 
thousand years of days to come. With all creation I sing, praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. of lightning, rolls of thunder, <laughs> blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you. a little bit more my height. <laughs> good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. Would you open your Bibles to 2 Kings and, and chapter 3, if you will. I would appreciate it. And that's where we're going to be. God willing, we may learn a few things from the life of Elisha. Our study in the life and the ministry of Elisha, this uh, incredible prophet that uh, received his authority from God through the prophet Elijah, will cover eight chapters uh, as we follow a series of miracle after miracle in the life of this prophet. Several are bizarre, some are, uh, might seem to you to be trivial, but uh, one in particular is notorious. 
I believe uh, uh, when I do a little research in this, this uh, chapter and in this passage, I find that uh, there's not a whole lot of people that want to tackle that. That's one of those places like when you're reading the genealogy, you kind of skip through. This is one of those miracles that we like to skip through because uh, uh, you know it, it may not make a lot of sense to us when we read it. You see, uh, this is the story of the hare and prayer and, uh, and bears. And I think at the end of that, you just want to say, oh my, right? You know, okay, I know that went over my head too, but uh, you know, it is a story that in and of itself is seems to be a little strange and out of character and kind of unsettling when you read it just on the surface. It's it's a it's a short little story, and here's the whole thing. Starting in verse 23, 24, and 25, you find the whole story empowered in this miracle. It says, Then he went up from there to Bethel. And he was going up by the way. And young lads came out from the city and mocked him and said to him, Go up, you old bald head! Go up, you bald head! And when he looked behind him, he saw them, and he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And then two female bears came out of the woods and tore up 42 lads of their number. And he went from there to Mount Carmel, and from there he returned to Samaria. Now, when you read that story, I, I think, especially we modern, sophisticated individuals might have a tendency to, to laugh because there might be almost a cartoonish character about the whole thing. Uh, it uh, really, it, 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 for many, is a very troubling story, troubling that the prophet seems to be so petty, troubling that uh, it seems that God honored the pettiness of the prophet and, uh, you know, in such a gruesome fashion. Imagine a whole group of boys out there and they're just doing what boys do and all of a sudden the prophet in for whatever purpose, curses them, and uh, two bears come out of the woods and start mauling the kids. Kind of unsettling. The event described in these verses may seem repulsive to many and totally out of character for the personality of Elijah, who seems to be much more mild-mannered than uh, his predecessor, than Elijah. might have been more fitting for Elijah, who called fire down, and they put all those prophets of Baal in a story to death. But we need to remember that the Word of God is active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it is God's mighty channel that the Spirit uses to bring men out of darkness and into His marvelous light and change them into the very image of His Son. So what uh, are we to make of Elijah's curse on these boys? Was he just being a grumpy old man resorting to overkill? Was he so hate-filled and intolerant that he couldn't take some good-natured jesting from uh, a group of grade school children? Is, is that what we're looking at? I think many think that the prophet overreacted, and this wasn't a very godly or loving thing to do. But is that really the case? Maybe when we look at it a little bit more in depth, we can understand some lessons, even for us sophisticated folks down a few thousand years later. Father, open the eyes of our understanding that, Lord, we may see you plainly and clearly in the lessons you want us to learn as we look at this story. Father, I pray that you bless the hearer and the speaker alike. That, Lord, our eyes will be open to receive from you the message you have for us on this day. You are our tutor and our teacher, our guide into truth. So let us hear you today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. First thing I want you to do this morning is think about the context 
Think about the context of the story. The first 18 verses of, of, of uh, 2 Kings 2 speak of how Elijah's, uh, or this chapter speaks of how Elijah's anointing fell on Elisha and the mantle fell to him and Elijah is taken up into heaven. We know the story and in verses 19 through 22 records his first miracle when he comes across the Jordan after about three days and that's the healing of the waters in, in, in Jericho. That was what we looked at last week, right? And by... Uh, and then after that, he leaves Jericho and he heads up to Bethel, and we 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 move right into this story of Elijah and the Elisha and the and the youths and the two she bears. By taking these two miracles, these two stories together, we see uh, and, and and put it in context with one another. We get a marvelous, incredible picture of the double-edged edged sword of the Word of God that uh, works both grace. And judgment. Grace is depicted in what happens in Jericho, and justice or judgment and judgment is what happened in, in Bethel later in this story. We see in Elisha's words uh, both grace and, and, and judgment, you know, throughout this whole thing. The two go together, people. Let's not have an uh, omnifocus view of God. God is a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of grace, but God is also a God of justice, a God of holiness, a God of righteousness, and a God of wrath. And we can't lose sight of that fact. We, we can't have such a myopic view of God that we miss the fact that, yes, God loves us, but God will not tolerate sin. You see, we can't, we can't miss that. And I think that's something we're missing in our modern culture. We always want to hear about the God of love, don't we? And, and I'm, I'm, I'm all for that. I like the stories that make me feel really good and, 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 uh, and, and, and everything, but I cannot miss the truth of the Word of God that uh, you know, if, if I sin, that surely God is going to chasten me as a child of God. And if I am not a child of God and I persist in sin, you see, there is going to be a judgment at the end of all of this. Is that not right? You see, the Lord can bring healing. That's what you see in verse 21. It says he went out to the spring of water and threw salt uh, in it and said, Thus says the Lord, I have purified these waters, and there shall not be uh, from, uh, from their death or unfruitfulness any longer. But you see, God can also inflict harm, can he not? I mean, when you take a look at it in the second chapter and in verse 24, he says, and then he looked behind him and he saw and he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two female bears came out from the woods and tore up 42 of the lads of their number. So you see, we see clearly <coughs> deliverance and we see disaster. Now, what determines the outcome is really the response of those who hear what it is that God is saying. You see, whether it's going to be blessing or, or cursing, uh, grace or, or, or wrath is going to depend on how I respond to what God has said and what God is doing. You see, God's given us enough information, folks, to know what it is that he requires of us. In Jericho, the people received the prophet, and by doing so, they received the God of the prophet, who, and, and not only that, but they sought his help. They not only sought his help, but they surrendered to him, which is evident by their immediate obedience. So they received a blessing. The blessing that comes from obedience, and that blessing was the springs that brought the city uh, water were healed, and, and they prospered in the area. On the other hand, in the case of Bethel, Bethel belittled the prophet of God, and in doing so, belittled the God of the prophet. And Scripture tells us, in the Word of God, you know that, that God is light, and, and He shines in the darkness of this world, exposing the sin of man. But man loves darkness, and because of that, he, hide, you know, he can hide his evil deeds in, 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 in the darkness of this world. What does John say? What do we find in John 3 and verses 19 through 21? This is the judgment that light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light. For their deeds were evil, and everyone who does evil hates light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifest having been wrought in God. So don't you see that picture in the contextual setting of, of, of what we're looking at between Jericho and Bethel? 
Jericho embraced the truth, the light. They, they walked in light even as he is in the light. But at Bethel, they rejected the light. And friends, light rejected is darkness intensified. It's just that simple. When God shows you something and you, you reject it, deeper is the darkness that you're going to walk in until you come back to that truth and obey. So the natural question is, how will you or how are you responding to the word of truth? Are you more representative of Jericho or of Bethel? So with the context dealt with, let's look at the location. Consider the location, if you will, for a moment. Following the ministry in Jericho, which is portrayed as a kind of first fruits of the land, Elisha, as a man of God, under the direction of God, goes to Bethel, the place that is, is named the, the, the house of God, Beth, uh, Beth being house, El being God, so Bethel means house of God. So he's going up there, to there, there's a school of the prophets there, so he's going to, to, to minister and really bring uh, you know, uh, the, the, the very presence of, of God through the prophet into that darkened situation. In chapter 2, verse 23, the first part of it says, Then he went up from there. You see, Jericho is down here in a valley. Bethel is up on a mountain. So he's going up. I think there's about a 1,500-foot uh, climb up you know, to get to Bethel. So that's what he means when he says he came up to, uh, from Jericho up to Bethel. You would have thought that Jericho, which had been under God's curse, you know, way back in Joshua's day, it was, uh, it was uh, Halil, it was, it was under a curse. It was dedicated. God wasn't even supposed to be rebuilt. We will go into that story in another time. That they would have been hostile toward the prophet of God. And at Bethel, which held a very special significance and was holy unto the Lord, even before Joshua, they would have embraced the prophet. But that was just the reverse. Everything upside down. You see, Bethel is where God revealed himself to Jacob. And where Jacob uh, anointed a pillar and dedicated himself to God, it is the place that he called Bethel because he, he, he was there. It was there that he saw the ladder let down and, he, and the angels coming down and, and going up. But you see, now Bethel is, is a place of idolatry and of rebellion. It's not really the house of God any longer. Bethel was one of the two cities that Jeroboam the first, when the first king of Israel after, after the rebellion and the division that he set up. Remember one in, in Bethel and one in Dan, he set up a place where he raised up the golden calves so that they would come to the golden calf shrine and worship there so they wouldn't be tempted to go back to the temple, back to Jerusalem. And he caused the people to sin greatly as he did that. Bethel was a place where God had revealed himself and had become the focal point and a symbol of Israel's apostasy and sin. In fact, years later, Hosea, who ministered after Elijah, called the city Beth Haven. You see, Beth Haven means house of wickedness, a place of shame and idolatry. In fact, three times Hosea refers to Bethel as being Bethaven. For example, in Hosea chapter 10, verse 5, it says, The inhabitants of Samaria will fear for the calf of Bethaven. Indeed, its people will mourn for it, and its idolatrous priests will cry out for it over its glory since it has departed from it. I told you Beth means house of, and uh, uh, Evan means uh, sorrow or calamity or emptiness or failure. So you see, Bethel had become Beth Haven. Instead of a house of blessing, it became a house of shame and of sorrow and calamity and emptiness and failure. I think the point in all of that is that when men are empty of God and his word, they fill their lives up with vain things, whether they be material things or philosophic things. They fill themselves up with that empty stuff that never satisfies, which will lead them to idolatry, which will always lead them to calamity, always lead them to failure, always lead them to shame. 
Isn't that the truth? So these young men were representative of the wickedness and the blasphemy that this city had come to represent. Elisha wasn't just, you know, their attack on Elisha wasn't just some uh, sudden whim of over-exuberant youth. But it was an expression of determined, and a determined attitude of wickedness that prevailed in the city. In this light, Elisha's pronouncing a curse in the name of the Lord begins to make some sense, doesn't it? You see, we get the wrong impression. So, so consider the offense now. I mean, how great an offense if somebody just said, get up, get up, you old bald head. That doesn't seem like much, does it? But you see, here's the offense. Remember, I told you there's a school of the prophets in Bethel. So Elisha is on his way to go up there to bring the refreshing presence of, 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 of God, if you will, because that's what he's representing here, into that, that, that the followers of Jehovah that dwelt there in the city. And as he ascends up to the city, he's accosted by this gang of, of, of young lads. And I believe there were more than 42. I think it's a pretty good-sized gang of kids. And I'm going to get to that in a moment. But remember, it says that the she-bears mold 42 of their number. So that would indicate that there's more than 42. Some got away. <clears throat> any rate, take a look at, at the last part of verse 23. It says, and as he was going up by the way, young lads came out from the city and mocked him and said, go up, you bald head, go up, you bald head. Now, I can admit that at first glance it seems kind of petty and, 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 and harmless, and the reaction is kind of an overkill. But I assure you that Elijah was not some cranky old man who just couldn't take some good-hearted ribbing over his male pattern baldness by a group of fun-loving grade schoolers. It's not like that at all. So at this point, I want to clear up some typical misconceptions where it comes to this verse. First of all, there was not a group of fun-loving elementary school children involved here. This is not Miss Smith's kindergarten class. Please get that out of your mind. The word young lad there, the term that is used there can refer to males running anywhere from, uh, from a young child uh, uh, all the way to be where they're old enough to serve as soldiers in battle. Okay, It's a term that has a broad usage. This term is used of men old enough to go with Abraham, if you will, or Abram on a military venture, and men old enough to uh, seek marriage from Jacob's daughter. The term is used you know, for, for either one of those two groups. In fact, it's the same term that is used for the two spies that went up to Jericho and met with Rahab over in Joshua. So you see... You know, the probability that these are kindergartners is really, really a stretch. It's also a term that used to indicate that somebody who is under the authority of another, whether it be a parent or it be a master, a mentor, or a captain, or, or you know, a leader in the army, or under a king, you see, they're under the authority of another. Whenever it's used, that's what it's used for. It, it, you know, that's part of the usage of this word. So the likelihood that these young lads were anywhere probably from 15 to 25. They were old enough to serve. They were old enough to apply for marriage. They were, uh, they were a group of people that were under the authority of someone else. They were certainly not kindergartners or grade schoolers. Second, Elisha was not some crotchety old bald man without a sense of humor. I had one of my deacons in Broomfield, he he had, uh, you know, he, he had a ring of hair, you know, around like this. He's bald, and and he'd get ribbed about his 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 baldness all the time. And you know, one time I heard him tell somebody, he says, "I'm not bald." He said, "What do you mean you're not bald?" He said, "No." He said, uh, "He said I grew to five. He said I grew to six foot two. He said, but my hair stopped at six foot." Not kind of like that answer, you know.
But you see, Elijah wasn't this crotchety old guy. By all accounting, Elijah was probably no more than 30 years old himself. Probably just a little bit older than the young lads that confronted him as a big gang. As for being bald, it could be accounted for in a lot of different ways. Perhaps he was prematurely bald, which would have called attention to a stark difference between him and Elijah, who was considered to be a very hairy man in Scripture. So there's this contrast. But something else you might need to know, culturally, societally, baldness in a young man usually you know, was associated with, with people who had leprosy or some other unclean disease that caused the baldness. So there's that element in it. But you know what? It could just as easily have been the fact that Elisha shaved his head. You know why he would have done that? Elijah was gone. That's a symbol of mourning, of an association with that person that has gone from you. And it would have been perfectly within cultural etiquette for him to have shaved or cut his hair off so that he was expressing his mourning for the loss of his mentor, the one under whom he served. But whichever it is, whatever the reason, his baldness was really what not, was not being mocked. That's not what they were coming after. Third, the taunting of these young lads was not simply mischievous ribbing. It was a malicious attack upon the prophet of God and the God of the prophet. That's what they were attacking. The word mock there is a rare one. This is the first time it's used in, in, in four times in all of the Bible this word is used. And its root word means to disparage or heap scorn upon. And that's what they're doing. I don't have time this morning to unfold all the meaning behind the taunt. But for the sake of brevity, I want to give you a... a uh, 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 Amplified translation, if you will, of, of putting everything and all of the all the pieces together. It's like they come out in this huge gang and they're 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 saying, Get out of here, you effeminate leper, you unclean person, you would be prophet. We fear neither you nor your God. So go up, go up, join your master. Go up, go on up to the sky if you can. And leave us alone. That really is at the heart. That's the essence of the mock that they're giving. They're trying to drive the prophet of God away. Elisha was God's prophet representing God to the people, whereas these young men were representatives of the false gods that had taken over there at Bethel and continued to lead the people into idolatry. So the attack against Elijah was attack against God very much like Saul's attack on the church was an attack on Christ. Remember the discussion that Jesus had with Saul on the Damascus Road? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You see, there's no difference between the two stories. The mocking of this gang and the murderous rampage that Saul was on. So to insult and reject God's prophet was to insult and reject God. And this was a personal insult to Elisha. In fact, very likely, calling attention to the bald head means that, that the one that is over you isn't there anymore. Because Elijah was gone. The one who was the head over Elisha was gone. So it's more calling, uh, calling attention to the fact that uh, you aren't a prophet of God. Your, your master is gone. Go on and be with him. Go to heaven or wherever it is you're going to go, but leave us alone. You see, ultimately an insult to Jehovah, an insult, an attack upon the church, the representative of God anywhere. Those missionaries that are out in the field that get attacked, they may hate them, but their hatred's toward the God they serve and the God they represent. While the sons of the prophet in the city, Jericho honored the Eli Elijah's spirit, if you will, 
in the Lord's new prophet, but the men of Bethel did not. Their malicious scorn calls down a curse on them, and the immediate execution of that curse is evidence that Elisha was the Lord's prophet. Now I want you to consider the response. You're going to look at the curse, you've got to look at the response, right? God will not be mocked, my friends. And I think that's something that, that uh, you know, because we live in this period where grace is so abundant, and we don't see the immediate execution of God's judgment upon certain things like you do in the Old Testament, we have a tendency to think that God's a sound asleep up there taking a nap and doesn't notice what's going on. But understand this, God will not be mocked. Whatever you sow, be assured that you too will reap, whatever it may be. And our story is a case in point. These young lads sowed bitterness and hatred, and as a result, they reaped the whirlwind of destruction upon themselves. Look at verse 24. And when he looked behind him, he saw them, and he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two female bears came out of the woods and tore up 42 lads of their number. Now, I know this may seem harsh, but you see, God has upon occasion demonstrated a harshness in his wrath, has he not? You want a good New Testament example of that? Go over to about Acts 5 and meet a couple of people by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. How many of you remember those two names? I, I see that hand out there too. Yeah. Peter said, why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? And Ananias falls dead. Sapphira sticks to the lie when she comes in, and he said, why are you lying to the Holy Spirit? And she falls dead in the first burial in the church had to do with people's reaction to God and God's immediate judgment upon it. Hmm. Ananias and Sapphira. It's a story we don't like to preach either. The response to these taunts came from two directions. First of all, it came from Elisha's direction. He looked behind him and he saw them and he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Now, I want you to understand something. I want you to understand what he didn't do. Okay? He didn't turn and run. He didn't argue with them. He didn't plead his case before them. He didn't run after them. He didn't compromise his message. He didn't act or react out of self-love or self-preservation or self-defense from any standpoint of ego or pride. He didn't complain to the Lord about the unfairness of their attack. He simply ignored their words, actions, and attitude, and he gave it to God. He handed it up to him. He didn't battle them like the world battles. He just, simply, he just simply did what he did. This is what he did. He took on the armor of God. And we know that because the very first thing he does is he prays. He says he cursed them in the name of the Lord. He's not talking to them people. He's talking to God. He goes to prayer with it. And he handles them very much like Jude talks about the archangel Michael, as he dealt with Satan over, as they disputed over the body of Moses, you remember that part in Jude's little letter? What did he do? He just simply turned it over to the Lord and said, the Lord rebuke you. He turned it over to God. He left it in the hands of God. Certainly, he cursed them, but I want you to understand, by cursing him, he wasn't reviling them. He wasn't cursing them with bitter words. He was simply trusting the Lord and turning them over to God and left it in God's hands. The key is to understand what the word curse means. It doesn't mean to swear with vile words. That's not what this word means. The Hebrew word <coughs> galal carries the express idea of removal or lowering from a place of blessing. What he's simply doing is saying, he's just saying, God, remove the blessing of your protection on them. 
You see, that's the difference. When you look at the curses and blessings that are read from the two different mounts, you know, in, in, uh, in Joshua's day, you remember that story? You know, if you obey me and heed my words, these are your blessings. If you don't, then these are the curses. This is what happens when I turn you over to yourself. You can count on these things happening. Instead of being in a place of blessing, you're going to be in a place where there is no blessing. Cursing stands in contrast to the word blessing. The emphasis is on the absence or the reversal or the removal of being in a blessed state or in a rightful position which belongs under God's protection and under his provision. The principle is very simple. Without God's blessed salvation and protection, we all stand cursed. Isn't that right? What does Jesus say in John 3? Whosoever believes in him is, 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 is out from under the curse, but he whoever does not believe is condemned already. To live outside the umbrella of God's protection, of God's salvation, of God's life, is to live under the wrath of God. So Elisha, as a prophet, saw their hardened and rebellious condition. They're unresponsive to a correction. So what does he do? In the name of the Lord, Elisha simply turned them over to the Lord and to their own devices, which was in effect removing them from the common protection that God puts over them. By the way, we have a New Testament counterpart to this idea. Go to Romans chapter 1. Look at the last. I won't read the whole thing to you, but in verses uh, 21 through 25 and on down to the end of this chapter, but, but let me share some of this with you, starting in verse 21. It says, For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculation, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Then he goes down to say, Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their heart to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever and ever and ever. Can I tell you something, people? It is a horrible state for someone to find themselves pushing so hard against God that he simply will release his protection and turn them over to their own passions and lusts. The writer of Hebrews says, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. And when he turns them over, it doesn't mean he does anything else except he just takes his hand off and says, okay, you want this, you can have it. And the destruction is their own. But what did God do in this story? What did God do? Well, it says two female bears came out of the woods and tore up 42 of the lads of their number. Note that Elijah didn't call the bears out. God did. Elijah didn't say, here bear, here bear, here bear, lunch. No, he just turned them over to God and God sent the she bear. The mauling of this youthful mob was not a vindictive anger on behalf of Elijah. It was divine judgment that God brought down on them. The bears are no less divinely appointed than the whale that swallowed Jonah. Think about that one. But why bears? Oh my. Why bears? Well, take a little trip back into Leviticus chapter 26 when we're talking about blessings and cursings. In verse 21 and 22, it says this, If even then you remain hostile toward me and refuse to obey me, I will inflict disaster on you seven times over for your sins. I will send wild animals that will rob you of your children and destroy your livestock. Your numbers will dwindle and your roads will be deserted. And that, my friends, is what happened in Bethel. Interestingly enough, the earlier story where we're looking at the the waters in Jericho, the water described before its healing was that it was unfruitful. By the way, it's the same word that is used in Leviticus for robbed. Same word. Used differently in its context, but same words. When Elisha healed the waters, he declared that it would no longer uh, it would no longer cause miscarriage, if you will, or rob the land of its fruit. 
The incident in Bethel contrasts directly with the blessing and healing given in Jericho. Taken together, the story of Jericho and Bethel indicate the opposite consequences of receiving or rejecting the Word of God and the God of the Word. I want you to understand, however, that the bear attack shows that God was trying repeatedly to bring his people back through lesser judgments that became more and more severe over time. But the people wouldn't heed. You'd think that an act like that would scare people enough that they would acknowledge, but it didn't happen that way. They continued to ignore God. And it got worse and worse and worse until God finally said, okay, I brought judgment after judgment after judgment. You haven't heard me. I'm going to cut it off. He sends the Assyrians as his sword of justice. And Israel is carried off, never to return again until the last days. When the stick of Ephraim and the stick of Judah are brought back together. But they've been eliminated from the land. All right. Now I want you to consider just briefly as we close this out, some lessons that we learn. There's simply just a few that I'd, I'd point out. You may have written them down on your sheets already. You may have most of them down. First one is <coughs> to guard yourself against having a distorted, one-sided view of God. I think that's our tendency in our culture today, don't you? We only want to see God as, as the kindly old grandfather with the beard set upon the clouds, kind of laughing at the misdeeds of his children. That's kind of the societal concept, isn't it? If, if, if we see God at all, our societal concept is to see God as, as a kindly old grandfather figure. And we have this very lopsided view of who God is. While God is a God of love and mercy and grace, He is also a holy God who is a just God and who will not allow sin and rebellion to go unpunished forever. He just won't do it. Romans 11 verse 22 says, Notice how God is both kind and severe. He is severe toward those who disobey, but kind to you who continue to trust in His kindness. Paul saw the two sides. Scripture says the soul that sins, what? Dies. And the reason for that is that the wages of sin is death. But it doesn't stop there, does it? Romans 6.23 goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Two sides. Let's have a complete view of God. You continue to defy God but one day you're going to understand God will have the final word. It's just that simple. It's hard for us to get our mind around because, you know, how many times have somebody said, well, I'm going to, and, and they, they, they don't do it. I don't know how many times I hear parents say, you do that again, boy. And boy, do it again. Then they put two fingers up. You do that again, boy. I mean, we start learning from early. You know, I didn't have that problem in my home. Dad couldn't count past one. He never got that far in school, I don't think. He could not count past one. Mom, mom got all the way through high school. She could count to ten. I think Dad had trouble getting to one sometimes. You know? When you grow up learning that the word means something. And when God says, I will not tolerate sin forever, it's exactly what God means. The second thing is, we should never be deceived. Whatever we sow, we will most assuredly reap. Hosea says, as he's speaking of Israel, this Samaria area, beth Avon. as he's talking about all this, he says, they sowed to the wind and reaped what? A whirlwind. A tornado. Isn't that the truth? Paul says, don't be deceived. Whatsoever you sow, that you shall also reap. The, the law of the heart of us. 
you sow grace, mercy, love, you sow the word of God, you're going to reap the blessing that come with it. But the other is equally as true. Third, God doesn't take lightly when we ignore his word or hinder the propagation of his word among the peoples of the world. God takes very seriously this thing called the proclamation of the word of God. He takes very serious your witnessing. He takes very serious your testimony. He called you out. You were saved. You were made witnesses. After the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witness. It doesn't say whenever you feel like it. It says you are my witness. When you're driving down the street or you're walking through a grocery store or wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you're God's witness. You're either going to be a good one or a bad one. You make the choice of what kind of witness you're going to be, but you're going to be a witness. God takes this thing very seriously. You know why? Because the very eternity of people hang in the balance. How will they believe if they do not hear? How will they hear if somebody doesn't tell them? And how will somebody tell them if they're not sent? And you're sent. I'm sent. He takes it very, very seriously. Third, God, or no, four, uh, as believers, we should expect opposition. I don't think I have to say a lot about that. You know? The more you move out for the Lord, the more you stand for Him, the more you, you seek to live righteously in this world, the more you're likely to come under attack by anybody and everybody in various schemes that are going to come against you. Paul says, everyone who wants to live godly in Christ will be persecuted. And lastly, when God reveals Himself to you, it demands an action and a surrender on your what made the difference between Jericho and Bethel was the response of the people within the communities. How will you respond when God speaks? Will you be like the people of Jericho or like the people of Bethel? Will you act like the young lads or like the town folks? Of Jericho. When you hear God speak, whether it's in the Sunday school lesson, a service, a Bible study, or in your own study by yourself with the word open and God pouring himself into you, how will you respond? Would you stand with me as we pray? Father, I thank you for a really, really strange and difficult story with so many profound lessons for us to learn. God, I just acknowledge that uh, there's so much of this book that we don't understand, so much about you that, that, that escapes us, because we're these finite creatures, Lord. But you're infinite. We can no more understand the greatness of God than an ant can understand a man. But Lord, there's some things you've given us to know and given us to understand. And Lord, as we have those truths and realities opened to us and we understand them, we are called to accounting before you. So Father, I just give this message and these words to you and pray, Lord, that everyone who has ears to hear will receive what it is that the Spirit is saying to them. And Lord, they will humbly submit themselves up to you in obedience and respond in faith. God, I love you. I love you for what you're doing in our fellowship and, and, and in so many across the country, what you're doing with, with our folks here in service and those that are connected with us through the Internet. But, God, we give you praise because we know, Lord, that you have assembled us together for one purpose, that you might reveal yourself to us. And having done that, that we might go out and share you with others. To you be praised, Father. Now, Lord, if there be any decisions that need to be made, whether here in this room or out there, and they need to get back with me, that, God, those decisions be made and that you be magnified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we sing our hymn of invitation, I'm going to invite you this morning, if you'd like to join. If they're singing and pray, and if you want to come for prayer or there's something you need, I'll be right here for you as we sing.
let's thank you all for being here this morning. I pray that God was able to, to, to bless you in some way, able to show himself in, in a wonderful way to you. And may God bless you all that, that are so faithful in, 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 in being a part of us and participating in your generosity and your giving. God has done great things. Able to send literature out to people this week that have requested it, wanting to know how to be saved or how to pray or how to witness. It's kind of an exciting thing when those things happen. So may God bless you. As we go out today, continue to remember Gracie, if you will, and Diego and little Danny, uh, as this is a day of great labor in more ways than one. Father, I thank you for this fellowship, for all of our family as we assemble together. Thank you, Lord, for watching over our sweet granddaughter and her little family, Lord. Bless now with abundant blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless as we get sung out this morning. God bless.